All right, good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Doug Plata from Southern California, uh, where it's usually not as humid as, as this, but I guess this is probably not too bad. Okay, so uh, I have back-to-back -back presentations. The first one is gonna be about uh, inflatable habitats. Uh, and then uh, at the uh, end of that, this presentation, I'm gonna leave a few minutes and gonna, on the table here, sort of have a show and tell, a, an example scale model inflatable habitat, and we'll just uh, show you how quickly it is to set up uh, inflatable habitats. Uh, and then uh, my second presentation following is on the topic of paraterraforming, if you guys are, are familiar with that. If not, then it will be a good learning experience. So, <clears throat> You know, I, I think all of us have heard about inflatables in different ways, and maybe we haven't really thought, uh, you know, put it all together and seen the many different uh, settings in which uh, inflatables are used. Um, certainly, inflatables are looked at, in fact, not looked at, they actually are being uh, used in low Earth orbit. Uh, we now have three, uh, all by Bigelow Aerospace, um, and so this is TRL-9, so the highest level of technology readiness that you can have. Uh, but looking in the relatively near future, uh, we can easily envision uh, commercial habitats. Uh, and in fact, the, the BA or the B330, uh, th I th my understanding is three of those launched uh, together would actually give you uh, about the same volume as the International Space Station. So just imagine uh, how low cost uh, our, our future uh, orbiting space stations can be. Um, there has been discussion about uh, having a, a so-called gateway uh, at an uh, EML point uh, between the Earth and Moon, uh, and uh, that this could be a place where crew could uh, to be, to be able to uh, study the effects, um, uh, such as on animals, of uh, deep space radiation, uh, as well as being able to do teleoperations on the Moon. It could be a gateway for both Moon and Mars, uh, sort of as a uh, a place where things could be assembled or, or docked. Um, interplanetary travel, uh, this is a nice way to be able to uh, significantly increase uh, the leg room on such a mission, um, albeit it may not be terribly shielded. Um, and then aerobraking, uh, uh, inflatables being used for aerobraking, uh, like Hyatt and some other things, um, is another application of inflatables. Uh, Bigelow is, uh, of course, uh, particularly interested in the moon, and, and here's his, uh, one of his models. An interesting sort of solution to the, the radiation shielding, sort of end-to-end -end sandbags uh, there. And my understanding, he would um, inflate these in orbit, dock them in orbit, and actually land an entire base that's assembled. Um, here's, uh, there's actually a number of examples of use of inflatables uh, on the Martian surface. Uh, this is a, a student uh, uh, competition, uh, one that was uh, um, submitted, and you can see a, a variety of different uh, sort of inflatables there. Um, one could conceive of probably a very basic uh, inflatable base uh, on Phobos, uh, if one were to be so inclined, uh, or even inflatables on, uh, on asteroids. But don't laugh. You could also have inflatables indoors, such as furniture. You can go, go online and purchase uh, all sorts of in inflatables, and uh, this is a pretty quick and easy way to be able to, to solve that problem, at least initially. Okay, what are some of the advantages of inflatables? Well, number one, as we've seen, we actually have a whole lot of experience with inflatables. One of the largest satellites ever put up, when, and one of the first ones was an inflatable. It was a, just a big sphere. Uh, Echo 1 and Echo 2, uh, really huge. You can see the people down there. That actually went into, uh, went into orbit. Um, and NASA is, has been doing an, uh, uh, some work on this uh, diff in different ways. Uh, this is an example, sort of a small example of a, an inflatable habitat, Kevlar and different linings as necessary. Uh, and of course, uh, just recently, the beam module uh, attached to the International Space Station. So this is a, um, it's not really inflatable, but expandable. So there's a slight difference. Um, some other advantages beyond experience is the ease of setup. Uh, and 
I'm going to illustrate that here, and then at the end, I'm going to demonstrate on a, on a scale model about just how easy it is to set up, um, especially as you compare setup with other sorts of approaches. So imagine you have a lander, and it has an uh, inflatable habitat that's packaged you know, really uh, small volume and, and small mass. Uh, it delivers it uh, to the surface, and then you basically just uh, open a valve on condensed air, and it just uh, constructs itself, just unfolds itself. Um, and it wants to go into a spherical or a cylindrical sort of shape. And to keep a flat roof, which I think uh, could be very helpful uh, to push dirt on, uh, you need some sort of tethers or some sort of system to sort of hold the shape. Um, but then what you could do is you could deflate it. Uh, and um, then telerobotically, go ahead and push dirt on it. So it's about the easiest way to, to get regolith uh, on top of the habitat. It's just deflate it, push it on, uh, and then reinflate it uh, and, uh, using regolith just right on the sides. Uh, and then the telerobots can go ahead and, and push dirt on the edges. So now, very simply, you've got a completely shielded uh, habitat. It's sort of turnkey uh, sort of thing. The equipment, like life support equipment or whatnot, could be inside the habitat when it's packaged up, or you could have it separate and, and bring it in, uh, even telerobotically. Uh, and if you figure that a mound of dirt is not worthy of a great spacefaring nation, then you might want to put something on top uh, to, because um, this, you know, our first uh, bases will go down in history. So we want something for the history books that looks nice. Um, so the distinct advantage is, is low mass when packaged, low volume, and yet after inflating can, can give high volume. And I'd just like to point out something at this, at this point. Um, the inflatables that are um, for low Earth orbit, I think is not a good example of the inflatables that would be on the moon or on Mars, because they have to protect themselves against uh, uh, orbital debris. Uh, and so they have these really thick walls that have uh, ways to be able to basically shatter their orbital debris as it, as it comes in. Uh, and when you're on a surface and you've got regolith all around, you can, you can use that as your shielding. Uh, and so the inflatables can be fairly uh, thin and hence low mass. Now, the, the volumes that you can get with inflatables um, is actually tr uh, really tremendous amounts of volumes. Uh, for those people who live in, sort of in the northern uh, United States and, and especially Canada, this is used all the time to be able to create very large uh, indoor environments where you know, it's snowy for a fair part of the year. Um, and I'll show you a, a little bit about some of the applications that are done. OK, so there's some advantages, but there's some disadvantages. There's, there's some challenges that need to be uh, engineered out. If you're going to be having people living within uh, these inflatables, you, uh, of course, are concerned about uh, radiation, especially long, long term. Fortunately, we have uh, data that shows that with a modest amount of shielding, uh, depending on whether you have water or regolith, uh, at uh, 20, um, 20 centimeters of water or 30 centimeters I'm sorry, the reverse. 20 centimeters of regolith or 30 centimeters of water, you can get the GCR radiation down approximately 50%. Um, and that is more than enough to uh, protect on the moon for, for uh, solar particle events. Uh, Mars doesn't have that problem so much because it has at least a little bit of uh, atmosphere. Uh, but for the GCRs, uh, it, it's working approximately the same. Uh, and I. I advocate uh, telerobotics uh, before. I myself would like to see any mission that we do in Mars orbit before going to the Mars surface. If, in fact, we do that, I would like to see those astronauts actually uh, teleoperating not for science on the surface, but to prepare for the next step, and that is humans to the surface. And that way, we can bind these two missions together so that it's not, well, we've been to Mars because we've been to Mars orbit. No, that's not good enough. Uh, we need to go to the, to the surface of Mars and being able to, uh, to um, prepare a habitat waiting for crew to arrive, I think, could help us make sure we make that, uh, that step. Uh, punctures are another obvious uh, sort of question. Um, 
Well, if you have enough regolith on top, punctures from external sources uh, can be significantly reduced in terms of the risk. Um, and you can use material. Uh, NASA and their inflatables, they use Kevlar. And uh, you know, if it can stop uh, a bullet, you could probably stop some scissors. So we can uh, help uh, significantly reduce the chance that there's going to be a, a puncture there. Um, and uh, there, there's other things. There's um, sort of self-sealing uh, uh, walls that could be uh, constructed either physical like this or, or chemical. Uh, where it reacts when there's, uh, and it seals itself when there's a puncture. Um, so I want to be clear. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that inflatables are the solution for all time. I think it serves a particular niche. Uh, and so let's talk about the phases. I think they are most useful in the initial phases. Um, so this is an uh, artist rendition, uh, Brian Versteeg, a great space artist. Um, and he uh, illustrates uh, uh, several different types of inflatables uh, used in, a, in an initial base. And I think that's where it uh, best applies before we really you know, get really good at using local resources to construct, uh, to make construction materials, we can go ahead and use uh, the inflatables. At, there's going to be some transition point at which it makes more sense to go ahead and use the local resources than to have the ease of the inflatable. So there's some sort of transition, transition point there. Um, but eventually, when it comes to like cities on Mars, there, it's not going to be inflatable cities. You know, it's going to be from the industries that are producing metals and uh, all, sorts of, all sorts of things. Um, so I'm sort of imagining, this is just very uh, hypothetical. I'm just sort of imagining that you start with a what I'll say is a unihab, sort of your initial inflatable base for, for the first people. Uh, and then probably the very, very next thing, it would be some sort of international Mars research facility, a similar sort of thing. As you're able to increase your, your download mass, then you can have larger inflatables that you can bring down. These are constructed on Earth. You don't, you don't, you're not sealing any material together or anything like that. It's pre-constructed, so it's high quality. You just land it and, and inflate, it, but inflate it after covering it. Uh, and there'll be sort of a phase in which uh, you're using inflatables, but then you're getting to the point where you're able to uh, uh, produce a fair amount of metals and plastics and things like this, and you can begin to go ahead and uh, start doing larger structures using local materials, and then the inflatable phase is, is largely gone. Um, so inflatables can be very large, and this gets interesting as we begin to think about uh, settlers such as retirees and what sort of lifestyle that they would like to have. Um, again, there's, there's places uh, such as in Canada where uh, they use inflatables, very large inflatables, very effectively. Um, uh, oftentimes high schools, uh, not often, but on occasion high schools will have basically their field indoors, uh, and they use uh, inflatables. Um, you know, so I've heard some people say, well, who would want to go to Mars? Because, you know, you'd have to give up so many things. You, you'd have to give up swimming. No, here's an Olympic-sized swimming pool uh, that's within an inflatable. So it's, it's conceivable. Um, especially if you have retirees. What's one of the favorite sports of retirees? Golf, right? Here's an example of an inflatable uh, that has a, not a full, you know, nine or 18 hole golf course, but it's at least a driving range. Um, and then what you can do is you can create a quote outdoors environment. Um, and this is where if with good design, you could go ahead and do high resolution printing and you can be growing grass. And so this could end up looking sort of like this. So you're still indoors, but when you tell the kids to go outdoors, it means <laughs> to go to the, to the, the other big room, OK? Um, so just some comparisons. Um, and, and I'm talking about the initial phase. I'm saying that, that I think there's some distinct advantages to inflatables that should be borne in mind. Um, when I say construction, as it's normally used, the idea is people sort of out there uh, in their spacesuits and they've got their operating equipment and it's sort of getting dusty and they're being exposed to the environment and they're you know, making forms and making sort of 
Martian concrete and, and these sorts of things. Uh, you got bulldozers and whatnot. All of this being, you know, heavy equipment that's being exposed to, to the dust. And we know from these sorts of things, things are going to break down and will need fixing. Um, comparing, comparing that with the inflatable, inflatable is really a lot simpler uh, to construct large livable areas. Uh, 3D, 3D printing seems to be uh, all the rage. Uh, you need to make sure that you've got binder that you don't need to ship, uh, and you need to think about uh, how, how frequently it's going to be breaking down. Um, whereas inflatables, again, you, uh, you pump in uh, air or um, you open a valve to, to air and it just unrolls and inflates, and, and there you have it. So I want to uh, introduce a specific concept that I have that I'll be uh, demonstrating here at the end, and that is what I call a unihab. It's just a made-up name for um, a habitat, an inflatable habitat that has sort of everything in it that a crew of eight uh, would need. Um, and it's not, the, uh, it's not the ecological approach, uh, not yet. So this is more like hydroponic uh, gardening inside. Um, so this is an example, University of Maine, which, uh, of an inflatable uh, habitat. And it would be like this, except a, a fair amount larger. But it'd basically be sort of pancake shape. So a single floor, flat roof, and circular. Um, and this is just sort of a, a diagram of uh, showing a, a top-down view and then a, a cross-cut uh, through the side and the, the approximate dimensions. Uh, and these dimensions and the sizes of each of these things are uh, due to what would be necessary to support uh, a crew of eight. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the uh, individual elements of that. Here's sort of a color-coded thing to help uh, see the different areas. So the bedrooms. Um, so consider, and I don't know if you guys have really considered this, but consider you have people going to Mars. Uh, and here is an astronaut. She's going to be going to Mars. And she has a, what shall we say, a five, six-year-old child. And she says to her child before she gets on the rocket, she says, honey, mommy's going to be gone for at least two and a half years, maybe five years. And so you be a good girl, OK? Can, can we do that? Would you do that? Would you leave your child behind for two and a half to five years? Um, or here's a, a fella. He's, he's going to Mars. He's married. Uh, she's not going. She's not an astronaut. And so she, he says to her, honey, I'm going to Mars for two and a half to five years. And I hope you're here when I get back. <laughs> they can do video emails. That's true. But I think they would prefer to be together. OK? So, um, so how about this solution? Let's just go ahead and send some single people. Problem solved, right? So here you have some, you know, four men, four women, and they're in an enclosed habitat for a period of years. And it's their workplace, and it's where they live together. Can you imagine any, um, any challenges that might come up? Love triangles or, what, or jealousies or who knows what. OK. So the fact of the matter is we're going to have children on Mars. We're, we're going to have you know, singles. You know, it's, it's all going to happen. The question is for the first people to go, and there's not a large social population there yet, you know, what, what is, what's the way to do that? So I think if you start extending uh, cruise day to like beyond a what, you know, the military, they bring you back in six months. So I don't know, a year, two years, something like that. These social factors actually become significant and even become dominating in terms of how soon people need to return. Um, so what I'm saying is that we may start thinking about sending couples sooner than later. If we're talking about people going and they are, you know, and they are going to be staying a long time, they in fact may, if they're married, they may want to go ahead and bring their spouses. So. For the design of the bedroom, I have um, four bedrooms for eight people. Um, so the hydroponic uh, greenhouse area, um, there's the, uh, the uh, lunar greenhouse, University of Arizona Tucson. Some good work uh, has been done on that. Uh, that can be applied in the setting of Mars. Um, and um, the amount of area for the, in the Unihab is 
for the greenhouses specifically to meet the caloric uh, water processing and air processing for a crew of eight. Uh, indoor centrifuge is, is uh, what I recommend. This would be um, uh, low mass uh, centrifuge that's indoors. And because there's regolith all over, then they are inside while they're getting a full G of, of uh, artificial gravity. Uh, and it'd be something like this, sort of a low, low mass thing. It can be made out of, this is a carbon fiber truss. That, that thing actually weighs six pounds, but it's holding up. Um, I'm not sure how many pounds that is, but it's in the two to 300 pounds, I think. Um, and then what I would say, and I, I, I'm just not able to find any picture to illustrate it, so together, you have a chamber at the ends that go ahead and swing out. So the force vector, uh, the centripetal, the combined force is always straight down through the feet. So they can actually be standing up when they're in the centrifuge. But the centrifuge is about 15 meters in diameter. So you're going about 11 RPMs, and you're getting a full G. So long as you don't move your head, you don't have Coriolis effect. So you could be able to spend two hours in the morning doing sedentary activities, two hours in the afternoons doing sedentary activities and getting the equivalent of upright hydrostatic pressure distribution that we get here on Earth. So that, I think, could help with some of the uh, medical conditions. So um, I actually uh, identified a set of sedentary activities that we all do, like we're all sitting right now. Um, and I actually went to uh, our local theme park with a co-author of mine, and we actually went through and we did, uh, we did these things, and it's, it's pretty easy. But you can't turn your head. You, you, you don't have to be strapped in. You just better not move your head. Otherwise, 11 RPMs, you will really notice the Coriolis effect. So let me go ahead and conclude with, um, I, I created a, a simple um, inflatable uh, habitat, the Unihab, with all the different sort of uh, portions to it. Um, and so I'm gonna demonstrate that right now. Uh, could I get the, the mics moved aside and I'll put it right up there? Uh, no swimming pool, but there would be a fish tank in my concept. So while that is um, inflating, is there any questions? Question in the back? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned uh, inflatables and also covering them with uh, regolith. Um, but wouldn't it be kind of a waste to go all the way to Mars and be inside something enclosed and be covered in regolith the whole time? Are there any plans for inflatables with maybe windows or some sort of way to have access to the outside? You know, and I'm not talking about like doors, but like, you know, windows that you can also experience the outside, you know, just like in normal windows here. Um, so I think we need to really pay attention to the to the um, accumulated radiation. Um, so I think we do need to be under, for much of the time we need to be under regolith. I, I think you could be a, on a budget, a radiation budget, and get outside. Uh, yeah, but even for exploration, I would tend to have a shielded uh, cab, you know, that the crew would still be, you know, protected to a large degree. Uh, but I like the idea of virtual windows, where you have a camera on the outside and a big flat screen, and you make it look like a window. There's even uh, on YouTube, there's even uh, this thing where it's the camera's tracking you, and as you move, the image changes. So it really looks like you're looking, you're looking out a window. To me, that's a pretty, that, that's what I would do. Who's got the mic? Okay, it's coming. How is it for uh, the regolith that's on top of the um, the balloon as everything continues to shake and move and you know things try to settle as far as I know that uh, Mars regolith is a little bit sharp um, is that going to constantly wear down through there I think that's more of a problem with with the moon uh, the regolith is, is sharper on the moon uh, my understanding is the wind um, uh, rounds the edges of, of, of Martian you know dirt the regolith. Um, I think with the right choice of materials and probably checking it, 
um, that, uh, that I, th I think that's a manageable problem. And again, inflatables are not, uh, you're not necessarily going to use them forever. I, I, you know, there's, there's a time you can always set up a new one or, or you'll be using local materials. Um, so that would be my answer. Thank you. On Mars, uh, what would be the uh, operating air pressure inside number one and number two? How would these inflatables deal with the extreme temperature extremes like 70 degrees during the day and minus 100 degrees at night? Um, so I'm going to speak about in my next presentation about air pressure, but I think the air pressure in in uh, the Paraform greenhouses is, is going to be different probably than, than this. Uh, I would be inclined to say uh, to, that we would probably have it about the equivalent of 18,000 feet, you know, about half, uh, one half atmosphere. And there'd probably be some adjustment of the, uh, of the, uh, of the atmosphere composition. Uh, what was your second question? Temperature. Oh, temperatures from plus 70 to a minus 100 degrees at mm -hmm. the equator. Right, right. So I think that the, uh, the regolith shielding is going to go ahead and help with that um, by providing a thermal sort of blanket. Uh, I think that would help. Um, I haven't looked into that issue enough to really give, give a good answer beyond, beyond the, uh, the regolith covering. So do you, do you have some ideas? in order to maintain the, the structure, it seems. OK. OK. Uh, yeah. How impermeable is the material for these bubbles that exist today in terms of having to replace air that gets without a puncture that gets lost? I mean, these very large structures in Canada, they all have blowers that operate continually uh, to maintain them inflated. And if you have an inflatable bed, you know, after six months, you're going to have to reinflate it. How good is the impermeability of the materials that we have today? Um, I think they're pretty good. We, we have inflatables that, that, will, uh, that will last longer than the inflatable beds that don't have such a high standard. You know, they, that's not so critical. You can reinflate a, a bed, but there are, there are materials that will, um, I don't have the figures off the top of my head in terms of like percent loss over time, um, but you are going to need to be processing your air and, and bringing in uh, new components for the loss. And, and in terms of replacing uh, the lost air, I think that is uh, a relatively small amount that you need to process from, from the external air to, produ to produce that component. Again, in my next presentation, I think you'll sort of see how that works. And that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I just jump into my next one? <laughs> yes. Yes. Back to back. <laughs> so for the next topic, it will be on uh, paraterraforming. Uh, the next speaker doesn't need any introduction because he has been already <laughs> introduced. So go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. And afterwards, you can come up and take a look at it. It's not too profound, but it, we constructed a, a you know inflatable, so it's pretty straightforward. Okay. So my next topic is paraterraforming, achieving an Earth-like environment much earlier, much earlier than what? Much earlier than terraforming. Okay. So just a context. Uh, I. I'm both a Moon and Mars advocate. I think we ought to go to both uh, simultaneously and. I think there's ways of doing it less expensively, especially the moon, uh, to where we can fit it within a flat budget. But um, at any rate, I think, my, my view is that we, I think we ought to do our, the initial missions to Mars sooner than later. Uh, I would love to see a, a Mars flyby mission just as soon as, as we can um, basically get the hardware. Because uh, I think the, um, we can tether and spin up uh, Frankly, for a Mars flyby, you don't even need to do that. Uh, and uh, the radiation, as I showed you in the graph, I think that uh, we can keep people within their career limits pretty, pretty well. 
Um, there will probably be what's called the base phase um, and then early settlement. Uh, I'll just throw in a pitch here. People sometimes wonder what is the business case for the moon or Mars? What, what are we going to mine there that we can ship back and sell? You know, and I don't think that's the right answer. I think the right answer is uh, what Elon Musk is saying, and that is people who want to purchase the ticket to move. And what age of people have uh, built up enough money to move, what, what age of people don't have uh, job obligations, what age of people uh, don't have to raise children? It's retirees. And I, I think that that's going to be the business case. So I think um, retirees is going to be a big part of, of early uh, settlement. Uh, and then eventually, that will grow into cities. So at some point along the line, uh, we can begin to think about terraforming Mars. And this is a pretty classical sort of way of looking at it. And that is, on the left-hand side, we have sort of the initial uh, astronauts creating very small bases that grow. At uh, some point in time, probably the, the Martians uh, themselves decide uh, what do they want to do about uh, their environment uh, if they choose to terraform it? Uh, certainly producing uh, greenhouse gases uh, seems like you know, one of the preferred ways, or if you want to do it quick, like Elon uh, has suggested, you could uh, nuke uh, the poles and release that CO2 quickly, or you could have um, satellites uh, in orbit you know, bringing uh, increased light. You could do it that way. When you increase the atmosphere, it warms up and it sort of helps to release more CO2 and sort of has a feedback mechanism if you push it. Uh, and then it gets to the point where the, the um, air pressure uh, gets to the point where you can have uh, some basic plants growing, uh, beginning to produce some, some oxygen uh, as the population grows as well. Okay, it's sort of just the basic concept of, of terraforming. Um, the problem is, is that <clears throat> depending on who, who, who's writing or who's talking, terraforming takes anywhere from hundreds to thousands of years to achieve that level. Um, in the meanwhile, you don't really have adequate pressure. You can't walk outside, you know, uh, and you can't breathe uh, either. Um, and then this intermediate environment, yes, you increase the CO2 level, but your oxygen levels aren't high enough for people to walk outside. So you've got a pretty extended period of time in which you don't have an outdoors yet, at least not outdoors that people could, could handle. Um, and if this is something that we care about, uh, there could be native life that would be affected by, by terraforming, uh, maybe, maybe negatively affected. OK, so my presentation is about, presentation is about paraterraforming, not terraforming. So here is uh, some definitions. Just off-the-cuff definitions. Terraforming, transforming Mars to be more like Earth in terms of its atmosphere, temperature, and life. What is paraterraforming? Establishing Earth-like environments within greenhouses extending as far as the entire planet. Okay? So the phases of paraterraforming might start with a greenhouse. Wouldn't think that you're changing the Martian environment, but you are creating an Earth-like environment uh, in, in, your, in your greenhouse. And then you begin to move on to, to something like, is it Morgan? Yeah, something like she said, where you have these maybe domes, and you begin to actually have uh, ecosystems that uh, create a very Earth-like environment that people can walk around without being in a spacesuit. Uh, and then the ultimate uh, would be to extend this uh, across the planet, even to the extent of what, uh, what's called a world house, if you have, in fact, covered the entire planet in a greenhouse. Okay? So is paraterraforming well known? Can I see a show of hands? How many people here, uh, before I spoke, uh, knew about paraterraforming? Can I see a show of hands? One, two, OK, so I'm going to say, can you keep your hands up? I'm going to say about 35%, so about a third of you, OK? And this is the Mars Society Convention, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at the Mars papers online, and I, I looked for any sign of, of discussion of paraterraforming before, 
and I, I couldn't find any. So I'm, maybe it's, at least by the titles, I couldn't tell it. Well, is it, is it important? Well, let me ask you this. While we're waiting these centuries, to get the environment so that we can walk outside and breathe the air, are we going to be walking around in spacesuits? Um, are we going to do that for centuries, or are we going to create for ourselves in the process environments that we can be in that are very Earth-like, even to the extent, and I love how close this looks, it just it fits perfectly, even to the extent of really creating fairly large areas that are our outdoors in this interim period, okay? So what are some of the advantages of, of uh, paraterraforming? It gives you an immediate, uh, meaning like, you know, you land and you set up a little base and you, you have probably start with an inflatable and you start working within that and you're, you're creating a, uh, a high quality earth-like environment. No issue with too much CO2, no issue with too little O2. It's, it's just, you know, perfect for humans, okay? Certainly there's psychological benefits to being able to be in an environment that's very Earth-like, uh, lots of greenery. Um, and this is interesting, the Earth-like environment, these paraterraform, these greenhouse environments, are where you need it when you need it, meaning it's not going to be on the plateau because nobody's living there, but people are living here, and so you build onto it, the greenhouses of increasing sizes. And so your house is next to the outdoors, which is where you want it most. By outdoors, I mean the indoor outdoors. Got that? Um, so in order to think about how much it would cost and how much effort it would take to get to the point where the atmosphere throughout Mars is, is Earth-like, how much money that would take, whereas with a little, not a little, but large greenhouses, um, you can go ahead and create that environment early on, and it's certainly not covering the planet, but it took some money, but not a lot of money to go ahead and, and get to that point. Um, and this is sort of iffy, I, I fully admit, and that is planetary protection. If we want to keep certain, certain zones in, an, in a Mars-like environment, you could go ahead and keep your Earth-like environments with, within the paraterraformed areas, within your greenhouses. Uh, but I, I do need to acknowledge that if there's a, uh, a puncture, if, if there's anything from your system gets outside, then you're exposing the environment and the dust can go ahead and take it. So I'm not sure that this is a, a complete uh, advantage, but it would reduce the exposure uh, to, the, to the native environment. So some details, and I'm just freely throw in a little disclaimer here. I wanted to introduce the topic of paraterraforming because I think it's a, it's a not well understood topic, and I think it should be, because I think it's a practical sort of solution for Earth-like environment in the near term. But I'm not an expert in this. Um, there's relatively few experts. Um, so here's some, some ideas that I have about how this might be able to work. I think it could start with uh, inflatables, and in fact, Kevlar is about a, is about a, a third of a kilogram per square meter, uh, and if you have, for example, a 22 uh, kilogram payload that's constructed on Earth and delivered, that would, that would provide you about nine acres of enclosed area. So it is possible to, to provide pretty large areas with relatively little mass through inflatables. I've, I've shown you uh, sort of my concept for initial inflatable in which you have that, that green, uh, hydroponic greenhouse area. And I've shown you uh, this about how uh, you could begin to start having large inflatables and, and providing uh, the paraterraformed areas. And I did mention about the, um, uh, the greenhouse work that has been done. But now here's this uh, quote outdoors, the indoor outdoor concept. And have any of you been to like the Venetian in, in, uh, in Las Vegas? And, and you're in this little Venetian city, but you look up and it's sort of domed and the lights you know, change with the day. Um, and so you can actually create some, some environments that make you feel like you're outdoors, but, but you're actually not. Um, <clears throat> and so yeah, so there's 
this idea about having these large areas that look like you're outdoors and you can have the birds chirping through the, through the uh, speakers um, and the wind blowing because you got fans, uh, things like that. But there are some obvious challenges uh, with, uh, with paired terraforming. Probably the most obvious is the punctures. Um, well, <clears throat> for, for starters, um, if, if this is for radiation purposes, if it's covered with regolith, um, then that's going to provide some protection against, uh, against micrometeorites, those of the size that get through the atmosphere, uh, but, but still, you know, they don't, they don't burn up that size. You can do things to address that. You can have uh, chemicals, you can have, uh, like I said, the physical sort of approaches to, to, to automatically sealing it, or at least to slow down the leak so that you can repair it mm -hmm. without too much loss. Um, with the radiation, again, uh, covering uh, habitats, uh, including these paraterraformed areas, I would be concerned about the plants that live, uh, live a long time in weather, uh, being exposed to chronic radiation, how, how well they would do. Again, there is the Chernobyl uh, point, which I think is, it was a good one. But I think more study needs to be done, uh, especially like fruit trees and how well they would perform uh, given radiation. Um, having Telerops robots to go ahead and put the shielding on. Um, and um, the, again, the, the amount of radiation, the, the covering that you need is, is a modest amount, uh, especially like if you have access to local water, uh, you can significantly reduce the radiation uh, because that has so much hydrogen in it. Um, now, extending the paraterraformed areas, this is where you start using the local carbon and nitrogen, hydrogen and oxygen to be able to produce materials uh, to be able to, uh, you don't have to transport it any, anymore, you can produce uh, your own materials to create these, uh, these extending greenhouses. So ultimately it needs to get to industrial sort of levels um, and creating sort of just very large uh, covered uh, areas. And um, using either nuclear power or solar power to, to go ahead and melt um, metals and cast them, sort of create the structures that you would need uh, for, for large uh, paraterraformed area. Um, I would imagine in the, in the future we'd, we'd get to the point where we could have automated systems that's just going out and harvesting the materials and, and sort of you set them going and you make sure you keep an eye on them because they, uh, machines have a mind of their own. Um, as they keep expanding the, the paraterraformed areas as far as, as, as you choose. Now, composition of the, uh, the Martian air. Um, here's, here's the graph of the composition. Um, and uh, there, is, um, there is oxygen, but a very low level, 0.14%. Um, uh, and obviously, most of, most of the Martian air is um, uh, carbon dioxide. But let's go ahead and take a look at these three components, because this gets interesting. We, we do it now. We can separate out the different components from the air. We do it on the Earth all the time. We can do that uh, on Mars, and we can exclude the CO2 and, and keep the, the argon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And when you take a look at the natural ratios of those, this is what it comes out to. If you exclude CO2, then 48% is argon, 48% plus or minus is nitrogen, and, and about 3.5% after you exclude the, the CO2 uh, is oxygen, okay? Now compare that with, with Earth, and you'll notice that there's some significant differences. I put the argon and nitrogen in the same color because those are basically would be buffer gases, sort of non-reactive, okay? But even if you remove the CO2, the amount of O2 is, is not sufficient, okay? So there needs to be some processing of, of the air further, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and put them into sort of partial pressure, I'll, I'll do it as, as atmospheres, just because it's uh, easier to work with that than percentages, okay? So those are the, uh, the atmosphere. And however, if you're living at high altitude, approaching 18,000 feet, uh, you know, people live their lives at 17,000 plus in the, in the highest uh, sort of place down in South America, then that approximately cuts your 
um, cuts your uh, total um, atmospheres to, to about half. And, and what, what it does is it cuts the uh, O2 level down to 0.1 uh, atmospheres. And people live their life there. So what we can do, if we, if we use this sort of a, a standard uh, for uh, the composition and pressure uh, within the, um, uh, the periterraformed areas, what we can do is we can go ahead and take the, uh, the CO2, which is a good source of oxygen, uh, and we could go ahead and um, electrolyze it or otherwise chemically uh, break those bonds and produce the O2 in obviously whatever amounts that, that we want. Um, and so if you increase the amount of um, O2, it uh, adjust it so that you would have about 0.2 atmospheres of argon and nitrogen and then 0.1 uh, atmosphere of oxygen to sort of match what they have there at those high altitudes in Peru. That's sort of be the minimal uh, that, you would, that you would need to be able to uh, approximate uh, places that we have on Earth. So how far could we go with paraterraforming? Pretty much as far as we want. Uh, and again, it would provide uh, Earth-like environment uh, fairly early on, uh, high-quality uh, environment. And um, you know, how far could we go with this? Pretty much as far as we'd like to. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, hi, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Um, regarding the total uh, gaseous nitrogen supply on Mars, uh, back of the envelope calculation says if you condense it at all, and then it all ended up under a, you know, a, a roof, say, a third the size of Mars, a third of the surface area of Mars, your roof would be about five meters high. Uh, is that kind of what you have in mind, or do you want higher ceilings? What was, it, was the last part of your question? Um, like the total supply of nitrogen on Mars is so low, like if you condense it out in the atmosphere, it'd be about two millimeters thick, uh, that even if you add as much oxygen as you need to make up the ratios you've described and then regasify it to something like an 18,000 foot equivalent pressure on Earth, uh, and then contain that under a total surface area of about one third of the size of Mars or something, then the total height of that in terms of the total supply of nitrogen available is, is no taller than this, the height of this room, so you can't even have tall trees. Is that what you have in mind, or do you need to get additional nitrogen from somewhere? Um, well, of course, we could go ahead and uh, we could import nitrogen. I mean, that, that could be part of it. I, I did uh, look as to how high it would be if you took, if you took all of that, if you ex, uh, exclude the CO2 and, and it basically compress the atmosphere down to about half an atmosphere. And, and I think that those numbers are that, that's approximately what I was getting at, yeah. Uh, now, do, do bear in mind that uh, you will have a fairly long phase uh, in which you have not paraterraformed the entire you know, surface of Mars. Uh, you, you would have quite a long time before you actually get to the point where you're beginning to run out of you know, nitrogen. And I would include argon. I think argon, I think we can breathe argon and wouldn't, wouldn't harm us. And so that, that Yeah, yeah, which, which is possible. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I, I agree that if you really try to do a world house, um, you, you would have a roof that you could see, you know? And so that's not exactly outdoors. You could sort of either make it cl you know, clear or, or you could have it painted in such a way that you, it's not obvious that you can see the roof sort of thing. But, but I agree that the, the amount of atmosphere is, is so small that, yeah, you'd end up with a roof that's not, you know, that you might be able to, well, you said five meters? Yeah, so 50 would jump into the head. <laughs> um, so that, yeah, 15 feet, so it's, it's within reach of scissors. That's sort of <laughs> my criteria. In other words, could, could somebody do a damage? Um, so yeah, it, it wouldn't be really high. Yeah, good point. Would you envision having regolith on top of the entire surface of the world, HAB, all around Mars for radiation protection? 
And if so, I mean, have you calculated the amount of mass that you would need? I think per square meter, you're talking about 300 kilograms, given the 30 grams per square centimeter. And also, would, would the compression, is, that that kind of weight on top of the inflatable have, has that been tested? Because, of course, Bigelow doesn't have that kind of weight. It just inflates, and then it sits there in a the vacuum. Yeah. Um, my hope is, is that if we really want to create um, what looks like an outdoor environment, I would like to be able to get to the point to where we could actually have a clear roof um, and uh, without regolith. But in my mind, that probably means magnetic shielding. Um, but I don't know enough about that to say if that's a, if that's a practical thing. Basically creating our own local uh, magnetosphere. Um, but um, we, we could go ahead and, and use, for example, ice that wouldn't, have, wouldn't need as much uh, mass as regolith does, because it has you know, more hydrogen bearing. Uh, if we actually got into um, uh, polyethylene, it would be even less. Uh, polyethylene is actually fairly good in terms, uh, in terms of a radiation shield. Um, but I, I would think, I would like to see if there could be another solution that doesn't require mass sitting up on top. Now, in terms of, remember, the, air, the reason why we get air pressure is because we have, you know, one, zero, three, four centimeters worth of, of water on top of us. You know, that's, that's how much air is on top of us. Um, and, and that's, so if you have an inflatable habitat and you put that much weight on it, not just mass, but weight, it would be able to lift. You'd be able to lift up because that's where we get our pressure from. So if you're on Mars, you're at uh, three eighths, uh, and uh, if you um, are inflating to, to 0.5 uh, atmosphere, uh, as I take a look at the the data, the radiation data, it seems as though you could uh, reduce the radiation significantly. I don't think we need to be at sea level radiation. Uh, people don't. Not all people live at sea level. So. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Uh, just one quick question. I was wondering if you could repeat your numbers, please, for uh, the kilograms of mylar to livable space or, or livable volume. 0.272 uh, kilograms per meter square, and it's Kevlar, not mylar. Okay. Sure. Great, you're very attentive, so thank you for your attention. Thank you.